everybody well. Good evening. So glad to have everybody here tonight. We're going to be looking at a topic tonight which I think is one of the most, should be, one of the most encouraging topics that we can have and understand because apart from eternal life, which, you know, is, is, is lasts for eternity, but we're going to be talking about the life that now is and the life that we can experience and where that comes from and how it's available to us. Uh, today, I, I do know, as we talk to many people, they don't really understand the new life. They don't understand where it comes from and how they can live it. Because to them, the new life is cleaning up the flesh. And the new life is just making this flesh better and going out and trying to live better. But I'll say that it's not that. Let's take a, the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses... 1 through 10, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father, as we study tonight, we do pray we'll study in light of the new creatures that we are in Christ Jesus. That will study in a, in a way that's in agreement with the doctrines that were committed to us by our apostle, the Apostle Paul. And we pray that as we do study, that it will be your son that will get the honor and the praise and the glory. And uh, we ask and pray this in uh, his name. Amen. Well, verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship. And, uh, and that's good news, isn't it? Being the workmanship of God, that we are everything that God uh, would, uh, would desire us to be. When we think about the way that God makes things, you know, when God makes something, it's, it's good. I mean, it, it, it's perfect. He doesn't have to come back and make revisions. He doesn't have to come and say, well, let's introduce a new model next week. Because what it is, it's his workmanship, and it's perfect from the very get-go. But in, the, in our life, as we live our life today, and the motivation for our, our, uh, our service, and the victorious life that we are created to live, what is it that the workmanship of God is designed to do? There are many, many people, if you will, who don't recognize or understand that we've been created unto good works. And, but created doesn't mean that God just says, okay, you're a believer, so now you go out and do good works. Because the works that we're created to do, are, are, they come from the empowerment of his workmanship. And what he, when he created us, and the life that he has designed for us to live is, will work in perfect, perfect harmony with his desire for us. The workmanship has to do with what God did in the moment that he quickened us from the dead. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and, uh, and sins. You know, that's a great place to start, right? I mean, how, how much further can you go from being dead to being alive? I mean, that's all, you can't get much better than that, can you? But what we're talking about is not, uh, not f a physical death. And we're not talking about spiritual life, uh, spiritual death. We're all talking about spiritual life. And so if you were like me, uh, and I think mo most of you were physically alive when you trusted Christ as your Savior. Is that right? Anybody here dead physically when they trusted Christ? I had some questions about whether I was dead mentally or not, but, you know, I was physically alive. But I was alive, so when, when God quickened me, and when I became that new creature that was a, 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 an example of the workmanship of what he did when he created us in Christ Jesus, it wasn't a physical change. Did you change physically? No. Did you, but we did change spiritually. 
And so the new creature and the workmanship that God created uh, when he quickened us was spiritual in nature. And we, we understand, that, like in verse 10 once again, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. How many times have you thought to yourself or you hear other people say, What is it that God wants me to do? What do they want me to do? And, and I t what they're listening for and looking for is God to whisper something in their ear or do some handwriting on the wall or send a special messenger down to tell them that this is what they believe that God has for you to do with your life. Now, they might be right, but then again, there's a good chance that they, they, may, not, they may not be right. But what God wants us to do is to, to operate in that realm of what he is doing, and this is what God in his sovereignty uh, wanted to, to happen and to take place because of the workmanship that we have that we are made of in Christ Jesus. Come to Romans chapter 6. This particular workmanship is designed to work perfectly and in harmony, if you will, in, uh, in God's program for grace. Now, we, let's back up a couple of uh, verses. Let's go uh, come to chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20 and 21. Because the foundation of understanding of everything we want to understand and approach in chapter 6 comes based on this. Chapter, six, uh, chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And it abounded in every way. It wasn't even close. It overcame it, and it, and it uh, swallowed up, if you will, uh, the issues of sin. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But for this, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we've got a decision we're going to make. What are we going to do with this knowledge of grace reigning? And so chapter 6 and verse 1 leads us to this question. And we, uh, uh, an honest answer, of course, is always nice for that. But uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, Well, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Anybody want to holler out? God forbid! Because that's not understanding who we are in Christ. That's not understanding God and his sovereignty creating a being which is designed to do good works just to go out and to live in sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Here's the real question. How shall, in verse 2, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That is a good and valid question. That's a question that every single one, every believer, at some point in time in his Christian life, his spiritual life, needs to address. Because if you think, if you want to try to convince yourself, you've never wandered away in thought, word, or deed for any length of time. Um, you're trying to fool yourself. Because we all go through those spells, some a little greater degree than others. So, how, but how shall we? that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Well, you leave it up to God to put it into perfect perspective. And God does not, to, not want us to believe anything just because, without evidence. And he's going to give us some evidence. And what he wants us to believe about the dealings in grace and the dispensation of grace has to do with some information. And it would be things that he wants us to know. And he asks this in verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, that is a major building point. When the Lord Jesus Christ died, he died paying the penalty of sin. When we got baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ, we were baptized into his death. We were baptized into Christ as sin and uh, uh, the victory that Christ was having over sin. It wasn't defeat, it was, it was victory. And so he says in uh, verse 3, he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. All these things that God did, 
We're baptized into his death. We're baptized into his burial. We're baptized into his resurrection. Grace reigns. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, God forbid. Don't you know this? And if you know this, it will help. I mean, know it. Not just have read it, but you actually know it where you can think about it and operate on it. If we know it to this degree, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, we are so identified with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that God's program will not fail. The only thing that causes it to fail is what do we choose? And he says in verse 4 once again, Therefore, buried with him by baptism and death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. It doesn't say we will walk in newness of life. The question is, should we? We'll never walk in newness of life in the way that God intended if we don't know about our special relationship and our special identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that I was baptized into his death. I'm glad that I was identified and baptized with his burial. And I just rejoice and praise the Lord all the time that I, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, that included me, and included you, and anybody else has ever trusted Christ as our Savior. So, we don't get one verse down, two verses down, or three chapters down. He says, let's put some application to this. And he says, even so, we should also walk in newness of life. We know enough about God's grace today to know that God will never, ever make us. He's not going to do it. That's not how he's operating. That wouldn't be grace, would it? I mean, they just got through a system that, that uh, wasn't based on grace, it was based on law, <laughs> the if-then principle, and God says, if you don't do my will, my commandments, I'm going to punish you. But he says in chapter 6 and verse 14, as we know very well, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So what, what, will, what will inhibit the newness of life that God is going to offer to everyone that trusts Christ as their Savior. What is going to hold it back? What will restrict it? One is we don't know about our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. And two, if we don't understand the issues of grace today in the dispensation of grace. Grace is God's answer to the law. Grace is God's response to what was going on in time past and the failures that man had under the law. And grace answers and empowers people. And we're given the choice. And every single time we, as a believer, not coming based on performance-based acceptance, but coming in the, in the life and the vitality of the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ, we can walk in newness of life every single time. We were talking about some things earlier today, and, and uh, it seems like there are a lot of people. You know, have you ever started witnessing to somebody, and you share the gospel with them, the good news, and, man, you're getting all excited about it because you know how good that it is. And they just sit back and they say, well, you know what, I just don't think I'm ready yet. Well, that could come from a couple of reasons. You know, most of the time it's just unbelief. But there are times when they don't understand grace. They don't understand what that means. And in their mind, I must go out and I must clean myself up so that I can present myself to God. And I want to be presentable when I present myself to God. And many times people, when they are considering, thinking about it, do I give my mental assent? Do I, by faith, uh, respond to the call of the gospel and trust Christ as my Savior. Sometimes people actually start counting the cost. And people begin to count the cost. And people, people think, well, you know, if I, you know, if I trust Christ as my Savior, then I'm going to have to stop doing this. Or I will have to start doing that. And that's not grace age living at all. Should we? Yes. Do we have to? No. Forgiven? Yes. So the, so the responsibility and, and everything that goes in there, it's up to God. He's the sovereign one. And if he's comfortable with those terms, who are we? <laughs> 
I think I want to be comfortable with God's terms as well. Because God and his sovereignty, he has said, I, re I require nothing from you because my son paid it all. The Lord Jesus Christ paid for everything. So we do that. So people think that, uh, you know, you ask some people, well, you really want to go to heaven? And they'll, they'll kind of hem haw around and say, well, you're not talking about today, are you? I mean, you really want to go today? Uh, that song used to be, anybody here want to live forever? Say, I do. And uh, there are a lot of people, well, yeah, I do, but I just don't want to go today. And the reason why they don't want to go today is because, many times, is because they're happy, or they think they're happy. They think they're comfortable in living in, uh, in sin. But they misunderstood about what being a Christian is all about. And it's like, you know, when we, it's, uh, the newness of life is like no life we've ever experienced before. Have you ever been full of joy? Have you ever been full of exhilaration? Have you ever just been overwhelmed with excitement and this and that and, and come out only to find out in the end it was pretty hollow, it was fairly shallow, it was fleshly, it was fleeting, it didn't hang around? Well, the thing about the newness of life is it never gets old. Because it has something to do with God's creation, or the Lord Jesus Christ and his creation. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. And read from 14 to 17. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh? Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And what makes it new? Old things are passed away. But behold... All things are become new. Everything is bad. We may have known. There may have been people who, who were contemporaries with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you could say, well, they, they knew him according to the flesh. But just as well, it, we, could, we can read the Bible today, and we can know Christ after our own flesh. But that's not, gonna, that's not what God has in mind. The point is, let's get a different perspective from that. Let's move from that way of thinking into God's way of thinking. And therefore, if any man be in Christ, and the difference and what gives us that, that opportunity for a change in perspective is where we are in relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've been saying uh, fairly regularly lately. But in that moment, that in that instant that we trust Christ as our Savior, faster than even our minds can think, God the Holy Spirit has grabbed us and baptized us and sealed us in all in that instant that we gave that mental ascent. I have had people say, well, what if I trusted Christ as my Savior? And here's where religion can really, really throw a monkey wrench in it. If someone says you have to walk an aisle and pray a prayer, or you have to be water baptized, or you have to do this, or you have to do that, and you, I believe that Christ died for my sins, but what's going to happen if you die on the way to get water baptized? What if you're walking down the aisle to uh, ask Jesus to come into your heart and you trip and fall? Now, you walked out of that, into that aisle because you believed. So when did you become a believer? That moment that you believed. And in that moment, God has complete and total control of you, and it happens faster than there is no event in life. You can't, you can't trust Christ your Savior in the next heartbeat your heart quit. And, and didn't make it, because God is going to make sure that we have that. But when we talk about, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And not only is it new, it's different. <laughs> and that's where, we have, that's where we have trouble identifying and really understanding. Because how do we relate to things? We have all our, our natural senses, don't we? You know, sight, smell, feel, touch, taste, all those things. But the new creature that we are in Christ Jesus, this life which we can live now 
is new. It's different from anything that we've ever seen before. Come to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. Ephesians 2, verse 13 through 15. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You know, we didn't scratch and scream and claw our way to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're made nigh. We're made within reach. Something that's, that's nigh is within reach. And it's there. It's available to us. It's just like when Jesus was on the face of this earth and he was walking around and the message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, you know, that's what, that's what he's within their reach. And that's what nigh is. It's available. We can, we can have it. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ answers everything between God's relationship and between man today. For, verse 14, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, and so making peace. He took of twain. He took of the Jew, he took of the Gentile, and he made something new. It wasn't some sort of reprogrammed or revitalized Jew and this reformed and redone uh, done over uh, Gentile. He took of the Jew and the Gentile and made something that had never, ever existed before. It is brand new. This is the first time in, uh, since creation that this has taken place. Because in creation, when God created Adam and Eve, you know, they were perfect. They didn't have any flaws until they sinned. And then we see that what God was doing throughout time, he was working with, with men. He's working with individuals. He's working with nations. He's working with Abraham's seed, but they had all one thing in common. They were humans. They did that, and this is how God dealt with them. But when the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished what he accomplished for us by going to Calvary, God made something that never, ever existed before. There's nothing in history that we can compare it to. There's nothing we can use and say, the only thing we can, uh, can use to understand it is by comparing it to something that we know is completely different. But this is new. And he says, he says in verse 15, he says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, and so making peace. Are you at peace with God today? You know, there are people all over this world who are fearful that God is going to get them. But because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we understand anything about being baptized into the... And it's a spiritual baptism, not a water baptism. But if we can get any idea, an understanding of what it means to be baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ, we can understand and put this into perspective and to recognize that things are completely and totally different. And our relationship to him is not based on our flesh, not based on this. It's based on the new identity that we have. And it says in verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. See, God is not mad at us today. God is so happy with who we are. <laughs> he wants to have more of us. He wants us to go out and share the gospel with people. See souls saved. See saints edified so we can see more souls saved and then more saints edified so that people can begin to live and to walk of, in, in light of the example of the life of the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ living their life through us. It is walking in, a, in newness of life. New life, but also a different life. So when we come wrong, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ. The only question we have to do, I mean, the, if we understand what's going on here, is say, how do we get into Christ? How do we get into it? And, you know, God is, God is so faithful. He is, going to, he is willing to do 
everything, and in fact, not just willing to, he has done everything in our behalf. Let's come back to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And we'll read verses 4 through 6. Because there are some things that a believer that understands what God desires and has enabled us to do. The challenge for us is not to look at it in fear of failure. It's not to look at it in expectation that if we don't do it this minute, we might as well not live or walk in newness of life in the next minute. There is no guilt. There is no fear. There is no failure because we're in the dispensation of grace. But he says in verses 4 through 6, in verses 4 through 6, he says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, now watch that one word there again, should not serve sin. Still, you know, we can look at that and we can see what God's expectations are. And we got two choices. We can either believe that God created a being which is perfectly uh, uh, equipped to live in a way that honors and pleases God, or we just look at that through our flesh and say, there is no way that I can do it. And that's true. There is no way that we can do it. There is no way that in our flesh we can live to the standard of who the new creature is in Christ Jesus. It says, but in verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, and have we? Absolutely. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. You can't get one-third or two-thirds or three-thirds part of the identification. If you get into the death part, you got into the burial part, and you are part of the resurrection part. And that's where the power comes from. That's where the ability comes from. And it's based, again, on knowing something, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him for this purpose, that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, it doesn't mean that we'll never sin again. But serving sin is like I am pledge allegiance to the sin in my life. It's like, it's like uh, you know, showing uh, a reverential respect to that. Serve it. You know, and it, the idea here is that it's a willful decision that we make. Henceforth, we should not serve sin. And truth is, we cannot walk in newness of life and serve sin at the same time. Because if you're serving sin, you're walking after the flesh, or you're walking after the old man which God crucified. But if you're walking in newness of life, it's just as true. You can't be serving sin and walking in newness of life at the same time. Our minds are pretty quick, though. And, boy, they can bounce in and out of the, in, the, in between those two things fairly quickly. But we recognize and we can either walk in newness of life or we can either serve sin. And today, during the dispensation of grace, we have such a fantastic message. How would you like to bend Jonah? How would you like to bend Jeremiah and, uh, and, and, uh, who wrote the book of Lamentations? You know, how would you like to have been one of the minor prophets who just went and just blasted the nation of Israel? And you talk about, uh, you, ever, you ever heard uh, a message that somebody referred to as, well, that message was filled with hell, fire, and brimstone. You know where that came from? The law. It didn't come from grace. It came from time past. It came out of, an, out of a minor prophet, or it came out of lamentations, or it came out of somewhere besides Romans to Philemon. And it would put the fear of God in people. But the, putting the fear of God in people today does not work in the dispensation of grace. Now, there's the qualification there. Because do people have the right to know what will take place if they don't trust Christ as their Savior? They sure do. Come to Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 20. 
Revelation chapter 20. In verse 11, you know, as we study the Bible, as we read down through passages, it's always a good thing to note what's being said, but uh, there's always, always a good thing for us to note what is not said. And this comparison there, oftentimes, it gives us complete comprehension. And notice what it says in, in Roman, Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. No place for them to do what? Hide. <laughs> they couldn't hide from God. You can't hide from God. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, it talks about the books that were written. We got the book of life. But when he says the books were opened, what do you think will be the final judge of what God accepts and does not accept at the great white throne of judgment? It will be the Bible. And so the books are opened up, and, and there'll be men of all stature and all understanding that haven't trusted Christ as their Savior, and they're going to know some Bible verses. Now, some of them aren't, but a lot of them will know there, and they'll, they'll say, well, what about this, and what about that? How do you think God's going to answer them? He's not going to tell them, look up at, at something out of the Encyclopedia Britannica. He's not going to say, do we have a Wi-Fi connection here? We need to get high-speed internet so we can look some things up here. He says, have ye not read? The same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the nation of Israel. Don't you know what my word said? And he says, and I saw, verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in, in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. You know, when we talk about uh, they're judged according to their works, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to, that we want to recognize as we think about it. What is the one thing that the, uh, the, the unbeliever standing at the great white throne of judgment does not have to offer in his defense? He doesn't have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He can't say, I, I uh, trusted Christ as my Savior. Because I think the Lord Jesus Christ, as the righteous judge sitting on there, said, no, I think if you had, you would not be here. <laughs> I'd be seeing you at another place. It wouldn't be here. So the only thing they have left would be their good works. It'll be their religious activity. It'll be how much money they gave, how, uh, how much uh, philanthropy that they had. It would be all the good things that they could done, thinking surely that's going to count for something. Counts for nothing. Because there's only one thing that counts, and that's the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it says in, the sea, in, a, in a verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We won't go look at the, the book of life tonight, but we know why is it there? Because early in the book of Revelation, it talked about those names that were blotted out. When God, when you're born, God in his sovereignty knows whether you are or not. But you have uh, either until death or the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in the dispensation of grace to trust Christ as your Savior. And if you don't, guess what happens to your name? It was written in the book of life, but it was blotted out. And so God can say, Lord Jesus Christ would say when he opens up the book of life and says... You're not here. And you're not here because your works will not get you here. Only my son will get you here. You know, the unbeliever is going to be cast alive into the lake of fire where they're going to be tormented day and night, moment by moment, moment for eternity. And there is absolutely no hope that they'll ever be able to change their situation. So we look and we consider that and we say, I think we can agree with Paul that now 
is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation because we absolutely have no guarantee of another moment. Come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. And today we have a great ministry. We have a great ministry to going out and being able to offer, uh, offer an opportunity of being reconciled to God. And because we know the peril that an unsaved person is, we says in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust are, made, are also are made manifest in your consciences. In your conscience. Well, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, that doesn't mean we know about the terror of the Lord going to be applied to us, because there is no terror going to be applied to us. Can you imagine God the Father, after everything his son went through, knowing that the believers are baptized into the body of Christ, we become part of Christ, we become members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones, and we are so intricately a part of who the Lord Jesus Christ is, how could God ever punish us without punishing his son as well? Therefore, knowing the terror, you think the Lord Jesus Christ ever spends one second fearing the terror of the Lord? No. But we understand it, we recognize it, and we persuade men. We don't persuade believers. We persuade unbelievers because we know the terror of the Lord. We know that they're going to be cast alive into the lake of fire. And we persuade men. Now look at verse 14. It says, It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. But what's the important part in that verse? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, or therefore, I said, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Well, what is it, terror or love? I don't think those are synonyms. I think they have different definitions and they, they represent different mentalities. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And why do we do that? Why do we constrain ourselves? Why do we have interaction with the unbeliever? Because we know the love of Christ. So we go that, and we want to put that into, put that at, at, as we go into it. But we are there, and we, we have this. And once we trust Christ as our Savior, the reason why we know we don't have terror, knowing the terror of the Lord, come back to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. This is why living today in the dispensation of the grace of God is the best dispensation that, that a man and his relationship to God has, has ever had. It's the best experience we've ever could, could experience. The only thing that's ever going to rival it, other than Adam and Eve in the garden before sin, will be in the kingdom. Because things are going to be different in the kingdom. But we're the first ones that we could come to this in, in uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now, I don't, I don't like uh, knowing that I'm not at peace with everybody, but you know, I got a special affinity to knowing that I'm at peace with God. And, it's, and why? Because of performance? Because of this? Because of that? No, therefore being justified by faith, because somewhere along the line, I just used the good common sense that God gave me, and he gave you. Every man's got that God consciousness in him the moment they're born, that God gave me to believe the gospel when I heard it. And now I'm justified by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have, as a present possession, peace with God, and there's no if ands, and buts here. There's nothing we can do to change that, because that is a decree that came from God himself. Come back to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So it says in verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge. For the love of Christ constraineth us. It's love and it's not terror. 
So come down to verse 15. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We're going to go down to verse 21. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Isn't that great? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Old things are passed away. Our old man is crucified with Christ, but we live. Verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You know what the ministry of reconciliation is? It is going out and telling people uh, who are subject to be falling under the tear of God because they have not trusted Christ as their Savior, how that they can be reconciled to him. And then how they can, too, learn to experience and to live as a reality the new life that we have in Christ Jesus. So it says in verse uh, 19, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. I wonder how many people you could stop on the street today and ask, what was, Christ, what was God doing in Christ at Calvary? And how many of them would come up with the answer, well, he, he wasn't imputing our trespasses unto us. You know, he didn't need to impute our trespasses unto us. We were dead in trespasses and sin. We were born in sin. He wasn't condemning us. He was making a way of reconciliation. And it says, now then, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And the reason why we pray people to be reconciled to God is we, do you doubt the terror of the Lord? I don't doubt it. I don't doubt for a minute that God's wrath on the unjust is real. And there's no negotiation. There's nothing that we can do. It will, in fact, take place. So it says, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. You know, the wages of sin is death. Always has been, always will be. There's only one thing that pays for sin, it's death. But it has to be the death of someone who's qualified to pay it. We weren't qualified to pay it because we're sinners. But the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, he was qualified to pay it. And he did it that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It took me a long time to get a hold of this concept. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I lived with that. I would come by, oh yeah, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You know what God said? Oh, get over yourself, you know. <laughs> That's been taken care of a long time ago. You're no longer, I don't see you as a sinner saved by grace. I see you as a, as a child of God, as a son of God. I see you as a believer. I see you as, my son, as I see my son. But when it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that does not apply to anyone that's ever trusted Christ as their Savior. Because the truth is, they no longer come short of the glory of God. I think that's good news. That might just be me. But I think it's good news. And for me to think and to spend even one minute of time dwelling on my failures because of how I fear that God will see me is a waste of time. Because I do not come short of God's glory because I am a believer. I've been given a new life. I've been identified with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can take that knowledge, and I can face it. I don't have to excuse sin in my life. I don't have to look at it and say, well, sin doesn't matter, because sin does matter. But I don't have to look at that and say, you know, I, I really feel guilty about it. Have you ever, 
ever really resolve things for the long term based on guilt. Guilt robs you of your power. It doesn't give you strength. It doesn't give you ability. It takes strength and ability away from us. So, you know, God's not going to put us in a penalty box. You know, if God was going to put us in a penalty box, he'd have to put his son in the penalty box. It just isn't going to happen, is it? Well, you know, as we think and look at that, there are way too many people in Christianity today that that's where they are. They don't understand what's going on. You know, there's such great news of, of where we are in Christ. Paul told the, uh, the Colossians, he says, let me tell you something. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. That's right, I'm crucified with Christ. But now, somebody quote it for me, I've lost it. I am crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we've got the resurrected life of the Lord Jesus Christ living in us. We've got the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that was so righteous and was so pure, it completely and totally paid for the, the, paid for the penalty of sin. And that's what lives inside of us. I'm crucified. The old man's been crucified. Nevertheless, we live. When was the last time you felt like you really and truly experienced the life of the Lord Jesus Christ living inside of us. Now, you'll very seldom really find us focusing on experience. But here's one I think is, is, is something that we should think about. There's nothing wrong with being happy in the Lord. There's nothing wrong with a, having a heart full of joy and content and excitement about every moment of every day. There's nothing wrong with focusing on our life and saying, now, let me choose today to walk in newness of life. Let me experience that. God has taken me, and, and the moment we try, for we are his workmanship. We might under, not understand that, and some days we may not feel like it. But that doesn't mean it's not true. In fact, that means this is something we take by faith. And as we take it by faith and we learn to apply it to the details of our life, I think it gets easier for us to do. Not to be derailed by bad thoughts or bad deeds or bad activities. Spend less time in the gutter and more time on the mountaintops of grace as we sit and we look at that. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Is this important doctrine for people today? And I think it is because tonight there will be untold, no way to even quantify it. But people who are often brought up in a religious background, denominational background, who do not understand what it means to preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, will lay their heads on their bed tonight fearful that God's going to take them and punish them. They're going to lay their heads down and be fearful and tearful because they keep thinking, I failed, I failed, I failed, and I just don't seem to be able to get it right. If they only knew how close they were. Because God never expects for us to get it right. Because he got it right. He created the, the most unique being for the dispensation of the grace of God, which is perfectly equipped to live in this world, but to live in victory. He created a, he created a creature, a new creature, whose life is new and it's different from any life that's ever lived, even for the Lord, until this dispensation. It's different. And he says, here, I'm going to offer this to you. So therefore we should, and it would be to our benefit, 
to walk in newness of life. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the truth, again, of your word. We thank you for the examples that we have of, of uh, messages of such good hope and encouragement. And we pray that that's the things that we'll think about. We won't think about our failures, but we'll just think about who we are in Christ. Think about the life which you have made available to us. All to the praise and the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.